All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this week's edition of ML MLFL. Today we have Lu Wang, who's coming to speak to us. Um, she's an assistant professor at Northeastern. And uh, before that, she did her PhD at Cornell. Right? And um, broadly, she works on NLP, uh, specific, more specifically on abstractive text summarization, some argument mining and discourse analysis. And uh, today, I think our talk's going to be about um, analyzing uh, arguments with NLP. Take it away. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation, and I'm very, I'm very happy uh, to be here today to talk about our recent research um, on understanding and predicting high-quality arguments with NLP methods. Is this too still too close? I still I, I feel like yeah, right. So you can move it away. It's the super mic. super awkward. I'll just do this. Yeah, that's fine, if that works for you. OK. Uh, Does that bother everyone? I, I think I can hear it, but the. Yeah. Um, I don't know. OK, I'll just. If you hold this part of it, sometimes it's better. Oh, this part? Yeah. This part? Yeah. OK. All right. I'll just leave it here, because I need to switch the slides. OK. I'll try to just stand here, don't move. All right. <laughs> uh, OK, so let's get started. Um, OK, so we often care about you know, other people's opinion on many issues, not only because those opinions are interesting, but also they can help us navigate through various aspects of our life, from mundane tasks like which movie should I watch on a Friday night, or uh, to fundamental societal issues. And when people express their opinions, they usually use supporting arguments to justify their uh, standpoint. So today, my talk will be centered by this question, what makes a good argument? All right, so I'm going to start with by introducing our recent work on studying the joint effects of argument content and linguist style on debate outcome prediction. So, okay, for the first word, so debate plays an important role in politics and government, especially formal debates are designed to encourage exchange of, you know, civil exchange of arguments and ensure fair hearing of diverse opinions. And for example, the personal debate can help us to learn what the candidates believe and thus can influence the citizens' vote intentions. So ideally, we would think that the debaters, they're expected to win a debate based on the content of their arguments, such as the facts they cite or the reasons they put forward. But in reality, it's always a mix of the substance and the style. Practice debaters will always employ a variety of linguistic you know, maneuvers to sway their listeners. But you know, well, sometimes things can go extreme. You know, you know, some debaters can be full of, you know, this linguist or stylist language, but without too much content. Um, <laughs> not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at a simple discussion um, on abolishing the death penalty. So the pearl said. Uh, brings an argument. When you look at a capital conviction, you can demonstrate um, innocent. Innocence grounds a 4.1% error rate. I mean, would you accept that in flying airplanes? And the concept response, the risk of an innocent person dying in prison and never getting out is greater if he's sentenced to life in prison than it is if he's sentenced to death. So the death penalty is an important part of our system. So both of those arguments are actually talking about the same topic, the execution of innocence but they're making their points using different styles. The first arguments use numbers, rhetoric question, and the second one uses um, logic reasoning. But underlying those features is the shared content, the idea of execution of innocence. It is independent of the language style, but you can tell that it actually inherently supports the pro side more than the other. 
Because regardless of how low is this error rate, it is just unacceptable. So it favors pro side much more than con side. Therefore, in order to understand how the argument content and the style to interact, we pre present a debate prediction model that majorly takes two assumptions. So the first one is that the debaters, they will issue their arguments based on some topics. So the debate topics, they actually comes with intrinsic strengths of different size, like the one we have seen. The topic, execution of the innocence, actually will offer stronger arguments for the pro side who supports abolishing death penalty than the other side. We further assume that the language usage will be different for the stronger arguments versus the weaker arguments. So let's see how can we do that. Previously, most effort actually trying to predict the persuasive effects of arguments uh, based on their observable variables, such as the linguist styles or topic usage, but they are studied as separate threads. So here, we aim to build a unified debate prediction model, which we are able to identify the argument topics and their intrinsic strengths for different size, and also model the interaction between arguments and the linguist usage for them. In order, so if you have any question, please feel free to raise your hand, feel free to inter interrupt. Okay. So in order to do this study, we collect 118 debates from Intelligence Square US, and they're all Oxford style debates. Usually, a panel of renowned experts will be gathered to debate on some contentious issue in policies or politics. Each debate will start with opening statement, followed by moderated discussion, and ends with a closing statement. And so who's gonna be the winner? So the votes actually will be recorded before and after the debate, so you know that who gets more votes. And the winner will be decide actually gets more votes during this process, right? Before we talk about our debate model, let's first discuss how to identify the topics associated with each debate and extract arguments out of it. Here, we adopt the hidden topic Markov model, HEMM, to model the topics on sentence level. And then the consecutive sentences labeled with the same topic will make up one single argument. And we further assume that, you know, the topics will be shared by these two sides. They, they always talk about execution of innocence, talk about deterrent effects, but they actually will use different distributions of those topics. So for example, the pro side will talk more about their strong arguments like deterrent effect, but the pro con side will talk more on the morality, things like that. So more formally, for each debate, it will consist of a sequence of arguments, and we call it XI here, from both of the sides. And here, different colors actually indicate different topics, and the sentences that are labeled as the same uh, color makes the same, uh, make, will make the same argument. So you see there are a couple of arguments from different sides here. Um, and then the, t the debate outcome will be denoted as yi, if yi equals one, which means the pro side will win, and if it's negative one, which means the con side will win. So further that our debate system is equipped with a topic system, which means that debaters will issue their arguments from k specific topics. And each topic will have an intrinsic persuasion strength, which may vary among different sides. And based on the example we have seen, right, abolishing the death penalty, for the pro side, maybe the execution of innocence topic will offer stronger arguments than the con side. But you know, for when people talk about deterrent effects, apparently that will support the con side who says that we should abolish the death penalty more than the side who's supporting abolishing the death penalty. So those topic strength systems, they will be represented as HI, which is a hidden variable. It is unknown, will be inferred both for training and testing phases. Okay, any questions up to now? Okay, so then how can we model the interaction between the linguistic features 
and the topic strengths, because we'll assume that, you know, for different uh, strengths of the arguments, like strong arguments and weak arguments, we would observe different, you know, language usage here, right? So then we will design some feature vectors. So here's how we model the interplay between the two. So each argument will be represented as a feature vector, and each feature would consider the information from the linguistic or stylistic features, and also consider the topic strengths, which are represented as latent variable here. We're going to infer their strengths during training and test. And based on this representation, for example, assume we have a speaker term like this, and it consists of one, two, three, five, four, two, three, four, five, five arguments here. And they're labeled with three topics. And for this basic side, right, the topic one are inferred a strong argument, a strong topic. And the topic two and three, they're inferred as weak topics, let's say. Okay. And then we will consider a stylist feature, the usage of you. And to combine it with the topic strengths, for example, let's consider the strong topics in this case. We're going to aggregate values for this feature U across all those strong arguments throughout the debate. And in this simple example, we have three, three arguments. So we just add one plus one plus zero, which it goes to here. So for the feature U and the strong argument, we're going to have a feature value which is two. So in general, the feature vector for each side will be formulated as the summation of feature vectors of all these arguments for each side here. And then for prediction time, we'll compute two scores. So for each of the side, we're just going to find the assignment for the hidden topic strengths that can maximize the difference between the two sides. And then we're going to get two scores for each of the side. Here, the W represents the feature weights and will be learned from the training data. And uh, the hidden variables HI here refers to the hidden topic strengths. So for prediction, the side with higher scores will be predicted as the winner in this debate. OK. Any questions? No. OK. So for training, we're going to use a large margin training objective. Uh, that's a good point, which is not necessarily true. We just assume that, uh, you know, okay, so there are examples, for example, like you can't always talk about your strong arguments like by just ignoring other people's like arguments, right? So you still got to talk about weak arguments. But we do find that, for example, the winners, they tend to own more strong arguments. You know, we'll discuss those later, but uh, it's actually a mix of the usage of strong arguments and weak arguments. Because you need to address your opponent's points. Yeah. Did you have labels for the topic strength? I, I knew that that was a label, but how do they get uh, That's a good point, and we'll talk about it later. But briefly, it's basically we need to take some assumption, for example, like uh, winners maybe will. Uh, frequently use their strong argument. So you can have some initialization of those hidden variables, but it's actually up to the algorithm itself to figure out a final assignment of like who owns strong argument, who owns weak arguments here. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So for training. So for training, we're just use the large margin um, training objective which will eternally figure out what is the better uh, assignment of the hidden variable and what is the values for our feature vectors W. And then specifically we design some cutting point algorithm for the training process. So I'm not going to talk about those, but I will focus more on the features and how, what kind of like observations we made during this study. Okay, so we actually consider a wide range of features. For example, there are like basic features I can tell that like the personal pronouns, they're actually are very indicative of the communicative goals for the speakers. And we also consider sentiment and emotion usages because they're very prevalent in debates. And for style features, we consider formality because uh, usually the, you know, the formal usage or informal usage of the words would reveal the speakers, you know, opinions, intentions when, you know, when they talk to 
their like other opponents. And we also consider hard words um, because they might be indicating uh, weak arguments. We don't know that yet. Um, so we also consider discourse features. So discourse structure has been very useful when we detect argument structure from the uh, documents, uh, like news articles, editorials, but they have never been studied, um, not so much right, studied in debates yet. So we'll consider those features as well. And for argument level features, we uh, study the readability scores, like whether you know if this argument's easy to understand or not so easy to understand would affect you know, their perception by the audience. We also consider a decay factor for the argument account. So the intuition here is that you know, nobody would just repeat their best argument forever because their effect, you know, you will lose their power as they are repeated or used out of context. Right? You need to respond to your opponents. So we just add the decay factor whenever this person uses the same argument again. Um, finally, we also consider whether the debaters would address their uh, opponents, like, uh, or like how much of the words they would use to address their opponents. So for experiment setup, we use uh, leave one out. We consider two baselines. The first one is just n-gram baseline including unigrams, bigrams. And the second one is based on the audience feedback. Because for all those debates, transcripts they actually also record like applause and a laughter. So we can use those as baseline as well. Here are the main results. So you can see that by using like, like you know, just baselines and uh, unigrams plus bigrams, we got about 60, like accuracy. And audience feedback gave us So the lower part of, uh, the form are the performance by, based on our system without topics, latent topic strengths or with topic strengths. So here are the additive effects of different groups of features. So firstly, what we see here is that, of course, if we use all of the features, both of the system with or without topic much better uh, than the ones with the used subset of those and actually also outperform the baselines. Actually, I would think the audience feedback baseline is pretty strong, but you know, uh, we can outperform that. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, what was, uh, is this all the numbers accuracy of the prediction? Oh yes, it's accuracy. Uh, then why is like audience feedback only 6%? It's like they don't like Uh, because I think one reason is that those debates are really high quality. So they are like, you know, governors, professors. So they're really good at debating. So at the end of the day, you know, we so it's good because we can control on you know the quality of those, which means that at the end of the day, they may just uh, make their choice to vote for pro side or con side purely based on the content. So that's to say, it's high quality, and then people will applause or like they will laugh whenever you really give a good argument. Yeah. So, right. So just uh, that's that's to say, it's not like a easy like data set. Also, as you can tell here, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, right. And importantly that, you know, if we add this latent topic strength variables, we figure out it actually can boost the performance further, you know, build on the ones without the topic strength variable. Yes. I feel like it's because uh, there are some like words, right? Like for example, if you're being polite or being formal, there are some indicative words there. Yeah. So, but even though you know there are like professors or like governors, sometimes they can be like not so polite. Sometimes, right? Very aggressive. So people don't like that somehow. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Oh, oh, so this one is just unigrams, so we don't use bigrams. Actual bigrams are pretty helpful. Yeah, we drop it. I just don't like that. Yes. <laughs> right. But if you add those bigrams back, it should be better, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, we also try higher grams, but it doesn't like improve it. So that's why I just report the best results for the n-grams here. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't affect it too much, actually. We feel uh, several different combinations of it. I feel like sentiment words just are not really helpful. But uh, actually, they're helpful when you add those topic strengths. You will say it later, because it associates with some strong arguments and weak arguments. Yeah. <coughs> All right. OK. All right. So, so let's take have some further discussions. We want to further investigate you know, about argument usage and uh, what are the predict features. So first question, whether the winners they tend to use more strong arguments? OK, so this is, um, so, so because we said that you know, the initialization may matter for our latent variable model, right? So we tried three different setups for the initialization of the latent variables. So one is based on frequency. So the one set that uses more argument will be assigned a strong argument. And the second one is both sides are strong. And the third one is the winner is assigned a strong. And here's how you read this uh, figure. Um, each of the uh, bar charts correspond to the topic distribution for the winners and the losers. And the left bar chart shows the topic distribution. Here's the strong, here's the weak for the winners. So the lower part, the green part, are the percentage of strong arguments, which are indicated with the number here. And the upper part, the yellow part, are the weak arguments. And so you can see that they sum up as 100. So f across these three different types of initialization, we can see that the winners, they always tend to own more strong arguments in this case. OK. And actually, this result is echoed by our human annotation. So we never use human annotation in training, OK? So we're just trying to validate whether we inferred the argument strength right. So we recruit a bunch of annotators, ask them to annotate whether this, they will read those topics and figure out whether this topic is a strong topic for pro side or con side without knowing which side is the winner of this debate. Right? And then actually we found out human annotators actually labeled 44% of the topics as strong for the winners compared to 30% for the losers. For, for the rest, they can't figure out whether it's strong or weak for each side. Um, and if you look at the raw usage, the raw counts of the, the, ar the arguments, actually the results will be more silent. So here is like also that the winners, they tend to uh, use it more strong arguments, so like 90 6 versus 86. So the winners tend to use, definitely use these more strong arguments than the losers here. Yes? No, they don't know that. Yes. Any other questions? No. OK. Right. Then the second part, we're going to look at what, what's the topic shifting behavior of those debaters. So interestingly, like uh, both of the sides, both winners and the losers, they tend to shift to their stronger ground when they do the debate. Right. So on average, there are 1.5 topic shifts in each term. And, but you know, winners definitely tend to shift more uh, to the stronger ground than the losers here. And one of the top shifting patterns we see here is that. So here's the uh, strength assignment for the winner, which is from strong strong to uh, strong weak, which means that um, they sort of strategically move to a topic that benefit themselves while putting their opponents at a disadvantage. And the last part would look like, uh, take a look at um, the, what are the indicative features for strong arguments and weak arguments. So let's start with the basic features. So what we found here is that for the strong topics or strong arguments, debaters tend to use more of V and they, which we, uh, we guess that might be just indicative of their group responsibility. And but for the weak arguments, they use a lot of U and I. So they either use them to address their audience or to attack their opponents. And for strong topics, we find they use a lot of like emotion words to show sadness and disgust. But for the weak topics, there are more you know joyful and trustful words here. Okay, and 
for the style's manic discourse features, we found that strong arguments are more formal and they use a lot of frames on capability and information. But for the weak arguments, they use a lot of conscious discourse connectives, which is very interesting. And also some more frames on the certainty here. And for the argument level features here, we again find that the strong arguments tend to be more negative, which I guess would have found for the emotion words here. So this is the sentence level sentiment. We find that the strong arguments, they just, they're more negative than the weak arguments, what do we see here. And lastly, debaters definitely need to spend more time addressing their opponent's argument, you know, if that is a strong argument for them. And, but it also seems to be helpful, even if it's a weak argument, that you'd better also address your opponent's argument. So those are the main interesting features we find based on the study. There are other ones in our paper, so if you're interested, you can just take a look. So any questions on this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't have that high level like annotation because there's no reliable like classifier to tell us, okay, so this is a something. Well, we do have something I'm gonna talk about later, but it's that af that happens after this study. So, you know, if you can have, you know, high level annotation, I think definitely we can use that for the study. But when we, you know, uh, did the research at that time, we only have a couple of lexicons, you know, like a discourse tree bank or all kinds of like sentiment lexicons. So we only got to study the fine level uh, features of it. But that's definitely something interesting to study. Yeah. All right, more questions? Okay, so that would conclude the first part of the, the talk, which is we present a joint model which can learn the latent persuasion strengths of topics and their interaction with the language usage of the arguments. And we find that winners definitely tend to use more stronger arguments, and both of the debaters tend to strategically shift to the topics um, that can offer them strong arguments. And also that we do sort of confirm that the strong arguments and the weak arguments, they differ in their language usage. All right, so after this uh, work, I'm going to talk about um, actually a short paper uh, on how can we detect supporting arguments of different types from external documents. Okay, so imagine there is a high school student, he wants to write an essay on video game, the relation between video game and youth violence. He'd like to take a thesis, which is video game contributes to youth violence. Okay, so what would you do when you start writing a thesis? Essay. You do Googling, right? <laughs> yes, you do Google, right? So he starts Googling, okay. And not surprising, Google will return you like you know, millions of results. You know, nobody's gonna read all of them, okay? But that's not the, 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 the big problem. The big problem is that if you look at the top return results, you know, they're pretty similar, right? They're all about some arguments. Yes, sure, it's about the relation between, you know, use violence and a video game, right? But, you know, that's, that's not very helpful in the sense that, yes, they're relevant. They're very relevant to what you want to talk about, but they're not necessarily the best arguments can support your assesses, right? They're not convincing, right? They're just relevant. So, and more importantly, people don't just use one type of argument when they write an essay, right? They usually will use, you know, like factual content like this one. It's about a one to 18 year old gunman who killed nine people in Munich, uh, Germany. On, sun, on Friday was the final first person shooter video games, something like that, right? And also maybe we'll cite some study just like how we cite other people's work, right? So a 2015 peer review study found that blah, blah, blah. And also, we also want to, you know, learn from other people's reasoning, right? Like 
Violent video games require active participation and identification with violent characters, which reinforces violent behavior. So, you know, when people write essay, we definitely will use a combination of different types of arguments. But this is what currently the R system uh, missing. The current R system just cannot give us the diverse types of arguments when we, you know, want to uh, deliver our persuasive writing. So. Our goal here is trying to develop some automatic methods to detect supporting arguments uh, from external documents to facilitate argument construction process. And there are a wide range of applications. For example, we can provide feedback to students when they write essays, or you can do debate coaching, and also can improve our technique for um, argument retrieval. And also that it can help you know, in general for the argument generation process, which is something that our group is currently working on. And surprisingly that there's not too much work for diverse types of argument retrieval. Most of work only, you know, focus on the evidence-based uh, type of information retrieval. So, for example, there are some work trying to identify the documents with evidence can support a claim or conclusion. There are other works just do sentence level factual evidence detection from Wikipedia articles. And as you can tell, Wikipedia articles, there always have to be um, objective. So, in our work, we're going to categorize different types of arguments, trying to confirm that, yes, people do use different types of arguments, and also trying to detect support supporting arguments by leveraging argument type information. So that said, there's no such data to help our study. So the first thing we do is collect and annotate some new data for ourselves. So we're going to leverage a data source called idebate.org. We collect about 1,000 debate topics and from this Wikipedia-style online debate forum. So how does it look like? A debate topic, for example, will be this house believes university education should be free. And under each debate topic, there will be a bunch of claim or conclusion, which from the for side or against side. Like this claim, which says individuals have a right to the experience of higher education, which is supporting this debate topic. University education should be free. And under each claim and conclusion, the editors will write down a paragraph arguments to support it. I think you can't read it, but I will just read it for you for one sentence. Like, university offers personal, intellectual, and often spiritual exploration. In secondary school and in professional life, no such opportunities exist as they're about inst instruction and following orders. Uh, not about questioning norms and conventions in the same way university so often is. And there is a citation. So usually under each of the claim and conclusion, there will be a pair of arguments. And uh, most of the arguments will come up, like come with a one or two or maybe more citation articles. So then we will hire a bunch of annotators. They will read the whole paragraph of these arguments and the corresponding citation article and to figure out that which sentence or sentences from this citation article can actually are the most likely ones has been reused by the editor when he or she uh, wrote this argument. And that actually defines our task, which is given this claim which is individuals have a right to the experience of higher education. And a citation article, our system will detect or predict which sentence or sentences can an editor use when he constructs this um, whole argument. Right? So this is like sentence level argument retrieval task. All right? And the claim will be your query. In addition to the relevance of those sentences, sentences, we also label four types of arguments based on the sentence level. We care about study and the factual evidence and opinions from experts sometimes and uh, also reasonings. So after carrying out a couple of like annotation practice, we figure out these four types actually can I think cover almost 100 of the arguments we have seen here. And so we end up, any questions for, uh, yes? Which 
Oh, yeah, so there are those cases, for example, like a paragraph, there are only like maybe two of them have citations. For the rest, we just don't annotate them. Oh, yes, they, they put a citation right after that sentence, so you have that information. Um, and then we just ignore it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, many times, you know, it's the, the editor's idea how he want to, you know, frame the thing. So we sort of want to get rid of it because we want to understand, you know, how do they cite or reuse the arguments. So that's sort of the focus. Yeah. Uh, but here we do have that. Yes, we have those. Yeah, very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very good questions, yes, yes. So we, I, I have this debate with my students, actually, should we just merge study and the factual? But we realize we want to separate them because we found that the editors, when they reuse uh, study arguments and uh, factual arguments, they behave differently. So it'd be nice that we have these two, you know, separate uh, schema here. Yeah, so we, we think about that. Actually, there are other people that try to merge them together, but I feel like a finer grain annotation would be better for, you know, later study. And for your second question, no, we, we just uh, don't. We purely just rely on the editor's judgment whether this is something we should trust. Yeah, but that's definitely uh, something, you know, we should think about in the future, yeah. Okay, very good. So, we end up annotating 200 debate topics. Um, and uh, um, yes, those annotations include sentence level supporting arguments, right? So whether this is used uh, for constructing argument or not. And then also their corresponding types. The inter their overall um, inter-annotator agreement is 0.8, which is actually reasonable. So, um, I. I'm going to skip about uh, skip over the type prediction part. We actually build a classifier based on our training data pre to label each of the sentence with their, their corresponding argument type. And then those predictions actually will be used later in our argument um, supporting argument detection study. So here, we carry out our study based on an existing ranking model, Lambda MARD, and they will consider three types of features. So the one is just consider the sentence itself. We don't consider query, which is the claim. We consider, you know, basic features like engrams, POS tags, name and cheese, you know, sentiment and emotions. And then the second type of features would consider relation, the similarity between your claim, which is your query, and your candidate sentence. So in addition to, you know, word to wag, TF and of similarity, we also borrow, you know, the evaluation metric from summarization and machine learning, uh, machine translation. Uh, so we use the their evaluation metric called rouge and blue to measure the similarity between the claim and uh, the candidate sentence. And the last one is a composite feature where we would like to model interaction between the linguistic features we consider and our predicted argument type. For example, if we have a candidate sentence S for a given uh, claim C, and if this sentence is labeled as the reasoning in our um, uh, type classifier, and we're going to consider a feature, the root L score, we're going to have a feature function to consider both the reasoning and the root, and it will take the value of the root score between the S and the C here. So we want to explicitly understand whether you know this argument type will play a role when we do the detection of the supporting argument. So the evaluation metrics are just I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, which are the uh, MRR and NDCG, the higher the better. So here's the main results. We have the similarity features and the sentence only features and the composite features and all of the features. So 
looks like, you know, the similarity features can only give us something like 48, but if we add all the features together, it can boost us like 10 points in terms of MRR. So the NDCG actually uh, holds a similar uh, trend uh, for the performance as well. Yes. So here we just show the effectiveness of those features we propose. And now we want to know that, you know, for each type of this argument, whether what are the indicative features uh, for the relevant arguments. So here's how you read this figure. We show different columns for different types of arguments, and each row shows some specific feature under study. And for the red arrows shows that for this specific category, the relevant arguments have significantly higher values than the irrelevant ones. And the yellow arrow shows that they have significantly lower values than the irrelevant ones. So for example, for the position of the sentence, we can see that for study, factual, and reasoning arguments, they have smaller values, which means that the supporting arguments, they tend to show at the beginning of the documents. And for we also studied the concreteness of those sentences and we found that for study and opinion, the relevant arguments they tend to be more concrete, but it's less concrete for the reasoning arguments. And also that similarly for the study and opinion, their sentences are more has more like higher intensity of emotion, but not so much for the reasoning. And we also found that the high quality supporting arguments for study, they actually tend to use more of the hedging words. Okay. And another interesting thing we found is if you just look at the claim itself, you don't look at the sentence at all. You just look at your query. And we found that, okay, so the first part actually is a similarity. So we found that for study, factual, and opinions, the relevant arguments, they tend to be similar to your claim, but not so much for the reasoning. And if you just look at the claim itself, if this claim is more concrete, actually that will make the study arguments and the opinion arguments intrinsically you know, more useful. You're just more likely to use arguments from study and opinion to support your concrete claim here. But you're well, less likely to use reasoning. So there's something pretty interesting. All right, so uh, any questions for those results? Okay, so that concludes the second part where we literally carry out a first study, you know, to detect diverse types of arguments uh, that can be used to support a claim. And then we also categorize different argument times and we find that, you know, the human writers, they do seek for different types of supporting arguments. And the relevant arguments of different types, they can be, you know, indicated or like identified based on different types of features here. And so this leads to some of our ongoing and future work. So the reason that, like I said, we annotate these four types of argument is that we want to understand how, you know, human writers, when they, they reuse those citation articles, when they construct their own arguments. So they actually never, almost never, you know, just use arguments as it is. They always just try to paraphrase, summarize, and generalize a lot from those arguments when they write their own essay. So. Now we're trying to, you know, use some text generation methods to figure out how can we help those writers to construct coherent argument. So that is one of my uh, ongoing work. In addition to argument mining and generation, I also work a lot on abstractive text summarization and also recently entity linking for user comments. Uh, so I'd like to use maybe uh, roughly five minutes to talk about those. You know, uh, there's another reason is that, you know, up to now, you know, I have never ever mentioned a word called neural network, which is not so right, right? So there we go, right? <laughs> uh, Right, it's just very briefly, some of our ongoing work. So, I actually spent a lot of time figuring out, you know, uh, the new abstractive summarization model. Most of the current, you know, state of the art, they just rely on this thing called the sequence to sequence. So, is there anyone who doesn't know what is sequence to sequence? 
perfect. Okay, so everyone knows that, of course, right? So they all rely on it, but they're really, they're so bad at handling factual generation. Here's an example, right? So this is a very simple example, right? Suppose the input sentence is, congratulations to Australia for seeing sense and dropping the ridiculous policy of not selecting their best players if they are playing overseas. And you know, humans are very good at this. They just generate something like, uh, generate a summary like, Australia have seen sense by revamping their overseas selection policy. But if you look at a sequence to sequence model, it generates England face Australia in the World Cup final on Sunday. It has nothing to do with the input. But this actually is pretty common in a sequence to sequence generation model. It's so common that I just feel like, you know, we're not doing it in the right way, okay? Um, and of course, there are a lot of problems. We figure out why they're doing this. For example, you know, it's purely just a data driven. Whatever you see in your training data a lot, you just tend to generate those, okay? So that's why, but nobody's just trying to handle those things. So we're thinking that this is not right and this is not how human write summaries, right? So what we do is we look at the input document. I, I know you kind of said, there are just SRL structures, right? Don't, don't try to read it. <laughs> uh, so, um, so here's how we do that. We have a bunch of, you know, like input, you know, documents, human read it, and figure out what are the key points of those. And we'll try to select some of those. And based on those structures, we generate a summary. This is how, in general, human would write a summary, right? So we're thinking that maybe in order to allow the model to have a better understanding or better capturing the meaning of those input tags, we would like to leverage semantic role labeling, basically to give it some semantic information, right? So, um, and so that, that's why one of my students is currently working on trying to marry the tag summarization and SR model together. So she built a hierarchical model for the document encoding and for each of the sentence, uh, she also built an SRL model trying to extract the SRL structures out of it. And then at the last two layers, we will first extract what are the SRL structures we'd like to use for generating the summary. And then finally, when we do the summary generation, we will look at both the SRL you know, uh, extraction and also the original input. So this is just a prototype, she's still working on that. And one way we can make it work better is just to use multitask learning, which is your encoder is not only aware of what summaries you want to generate, you also are aware of what kind of SRL structure you'd like to generate. So this is a, one of the things uh, we have uh, in our lab now. And another work is something I I mentioned to Brandon, which is uh, we'd like to do entity linking and opinion target extraction from social media content. So, uh, you know, entity linking and opinion target extraction is very hard, even for the news articles. And we found more challenges from the user comments because people are just so, you know, creative, right? So here's an article about Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande, right? If you don't know, there are two very famous young, uh, you know, female singers in US, okay? Um, you know, so people, they don't just call them Taylor Swift or Ariana Grande. They would like use Swifty to mention Taylor Swift. They use Ari to mention Ariana. And sometimes, you know, they just say, you know, out of context, they will say, she looks so young. So who, who looks so young, right? And then also sometimes both of my favorite celeb heart looks <laughs> very cute. The many things are just very hard to parse. And also that if, you know, if you want to leverage the article information, you will see that there are many other female fingers mentioned here. So that will bring a lot of more challenges when we trying to resolve what does this personal pronoun refer to, right? So, and this is just English. And then there are also other, you know, challenges from Chinese, for example, like many times, you know, in Chinese, we just don't mention anything at all. We would just say, look so young, and then who looks so young, right? It could be a male, it could be females, it could be a group of people, right? And so we're thinking that maybe on one hand, we can leverage this article information to know that, okay, so this she may not only refer to Taylor Swift, it might be Ariana Grande, and also that 
these comments talk about, she looks so young. You know, nobody's really talk about like Taylor Swift looks so young. Yeah, she's young, but Ariana's younger, okay? So that's to say, if you know whenever people talk about Ariana, they will say that, oh, she's so young. So you will get more like pro our knowledge uh, to know that this she might refer to Ariana. Okay, so then one of my students just built a uh, giant <laughs> neural network, but I think it's interesting because uh, we consider, you know, article information, <coughs> comment information. We also will first embed entities based on their context so that we can capture that, you know, Ariana is, for example, associated with young a lot, or Taylor Swift is associated with, say, supermodel a lot, right? So we have context-based entity encoding. We also have entity-entity relation encoding. For example, if this entity, you know, just appears a lot with another entity, you know, very likely when you do the prediction, you can consider all those other related entities together. So this is another work uh, at our group. Uh, so at the end, it's a standard page for acknowledgement. I thank funding agencies. I thank industry partners to give us the money to carry out the work. Of course, I really need to thank my collaborators and students who, you know, carry out all those studies. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, more questions, you know, like information will be fine on my web. Is that useful to model? I think that will be very useful to model, but we didn't do that. Um, and also there's one more point is that there, there's the moderator. So the moderator literally just decide now, this is the question we need to talk about. And then it's really up to the debaters whether I want to address you or just go back to my favorite arguments. Yeah, but you know, I, I think based on the topic shifting behavior, it's still like very high level, right? But I think it would be useful, like we model, you know, the, the really the topic, topic shifting, right? Whether you're shifting from your favorite deterrent effect to some uh, like innocence topic, right? So those should be more interesting to look at, yeah. That's a good question. So that's something we'd like to work on, but uh, online arguments, they're very noisy, right? People are nasty, <laughs> right? So uh, we need to do a lot before we really study what are the good arguments. Yeah, but that's definitely, you know, very interesting to look at, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very possible. But I feel like that's more like classic IR task, right? It's because, you know, Wikipedia is everything is fact based. So it's basically about whether, uh, you know, this sentence actually uh, tells the information of this sentence in your Wikipedia article. So we're more like, we request more about like entailment sort of, right? So because people just doing this paraphrase thing and also generalization, right? So you need to get an idea whether you can infer from that like argument from what I read here, yeah. But I think it could be, it is possible, yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes people just leave sight, right? I, I, I saw that a couple of times. Yeah, very good question.
So if it's out of context, it's hardly a good argument, right? I see your point. It's like more fine green, like kind of like prediction, right? Now it's like we do aggregation. So maybe there are bad arguments, but you have more good arguments. So you're still you're still the winner, right? So, but I think that's something maybe we can do it in future. But we just don't have the luxury to annotate on like argument level at this moment, right? Yeah. Right. Thanks.